Okay, let's get started. I today I'm going to finish interprocess communication and move on to an exciting topic of CPU scheduling. I got about halfway through this, I believe, last time. Last time we looked at chapter four, which was about actually we've done three and four, which was about threads and processes. And this lecture was sort of supplemental from the book, and it provided information on the consumer producer problem. Um, it, race conditions, deadlocks, um, we talked about critical region, mutual exclusion, and kind of gave you all this vocabulary. Uh, started out giving you some of the vocabulary. And I believe I stopped uh, somewhere around deadlocks or something of that nature. Uh, so I want to do it because it's, it's been a week or so, so I'll kind of review and I'll go through kind of quickly in the beginning and then maybe I'll remember where I stopped. Um, but this will help you with the uh, one of the assignments that has you do the producer consumer to run, write a CP class uh, CP uh, program. P CP program is called a copy program, so it reads in the producer would uh, read in files, excuse me, bytes from a file, load them into a shared buffer, and then the consumer would pull them out of the buffer and write them to an output file. So it takes one file through a shared buffer, copies it to a second file. Um, which creates um, a little faster technique than if you were just copy all this stuff at one shot and put it in here. So it, it actually kind of streamlines the process a little bit. We use interprocess communication and models like the producer consumer problem to create a more effective or more efficient environment uh, for the th for the thread processing. So here's how it pro progresses in time. Um, the producer can produce at any any one moment the consumer can pull out at any one moment. So it's the synchronization between the two that we're primi primarily interested in looking at. In terms of the race condition, there's a race <laughs> condition because of the timing of the which process starts first. And I'm just gonna I'm not gonna read through this whole lecture because I know I've covered this part already. But when two or more processes race for a shared resource and it's unpredictable which one's going to get there first, we have a race condition, which is occurs. Um, and a race condition might create a, a situation where the consumer is trying to consume something that hasn't been produced yet. Um, or the producer is producing so much, he's filling the buffer up and the consumer doesn't get a chance to consume. Uh, we call uh, the critical section, I went over this last time as well, is the region of code where we have shared variables. It's called the critical section sometimes referred to also as the critical region, another word for it. And then we have this concept of mutual exclusion. Mutual exclusion means that only one process at a time can actually access the critical section. If more than one process tries to access the critical region, they'll be issued a block and the, they won't be able to go into there. Why processes need to communicate to synchronize their executions, to exchange data and information, rules to uh, to form critical section. No two processes may simultaneously be inside of the critical region. That's actually the definition of mutual exclusion. Uh, no assumptions are made about the relative process speeds or the number of CPUs that are there. And the processes outside of the critical section should not block one another. Uh, so no process should wait forever before entering the critical section. Um, in terms of the starvation, this is one of the classic mutual exclusion problems. It's called starvation. Starvation occurs by definition when there is a, one process is delaying another process from executing and the other process just never gets a chance. So indefinitely delaying the scheduling of a process in favor of another process. You know, it's kind of like uh, not allowing them to run. If you're not going to allow them to run, they're never going to get their work done. So they're never going to get their running. Caused by biases in the system of scheduling. Uh, sometimes a solution to it might be to implement some sort of uh, aging. And if you implement aging, what you're doing is saying, well, if this process waits for an hour or waits is waiting indefinitely and hasn't had a chance to run and these other processes are running, then stop all the other processes and let this particular one that's been aging, let that one run instead, which is a classic solution to the problem. Another problem that we looked at, um, started looking at, was the concept of deadlock. And I basically mentioned, you know, how many, a little trivia question, how many processes do you need to form a deadlock? Actually, I've done this on a midterm exam before. And I've got like, you know, zero, one, two, three. You know how many students say zero or one? <laughs> you need more than one process <laughs> to form a deadlock. Because it's one process waiting on another process. They're both wanting to do the same thing, and so neither one of them can occur. 
So I always use a bridge as example when I sort of explain this one because when you know when two cars are approaching a one-way bridge and they both want to go on the bridge at the same time, they're they're approaching in opposite directions, they're going to block each other because both cars can't go at the same time, but they both want to go until one of them says, "Okay, you can go first, They're deadlocked, which is the classic scenario. So two or more processes are blocked, waiting for an event that will never occur. Generally, uh, A waits for B to do something, and then B was waiting for A. That's actually called a circular wait. When the first process is waiting for the second process, and the second process is waiting back for the first process, both are not doing anything, and both never get to occur. So. <clears throat> and then I, uh, we looked at the concept of uh, how to implement mutual exclusion, and I think this is where I stopped in the last lecture. And the concept being that there were three different possibilities for how you're going to implement mutual exclusion so to avoid any of the issues with starvation, with deadlock, or with race conditions. Um, so from an application level, programmer builds some sort of method in the program, creates logic in the program to avoid the possibility of there being a deadlock, so they're creating programmatically mutual exclusion. And the other point uh, on the slide here is the hardware or the operating system support. Rarely do we have hardware instructions now. Uh, everything is too generic. Operating systems aren't normally working that closely with the hardware. If you think about the concept of you know, how many different architecture, well, similar, they're all Intel compatible, but how many different types of configurations does Windows run on? If you make it hardware specific, you're really specifying too much requirement for that operating system. So you're not going to use it probably from there, but from the OS perspective, it, most of the Linux has, most Linux kernels have support for mutual exclusion right there built into the operating system. Provide services that can be used by the uh, programmer and these would be in the form of system calls, the system call interface. So all schemes uh, rely on some code for entering into the critical section then exiting out of the critical section. And then we have uh, this, I believe this is exactly where I stopped last time, going through each one of the different options. So from an application perspective, mutual exclusion can be implemented by the programmer. And I'm going to give you some pros and cons for each one of these three techniques for the application versus the hardware versus the operating system. So you have a little bit more of a comparison to deal with. From an application point of view, it's hard to get it to correct and it's very inefficient. You end up having to put checks in your program, uh, conditional checks, and end up slowing down your program. So um, you're adding overhead to the efficiency. And uh, it may all rely on some sort of a form of busy waiting, so the process tests condition, sets a flag, loops until the condition remains the same. So we are introducing what's called a busy wait. A busy wait is a process that's busy doing something, checking to see if it can enter into the critical region or something. But it's not getting any work done. It's just working. It's working. It's taking up CPU cycles. And as we, when we get into CPU scheduling, you'll see, well, that's not a good thing. If it's occupying CPU time, but it's not actually doing any work, it's not getting and approaching its goal of being complete and out of the system, then it's a busy wait. So the produce is producing. If there's a lock is equal to one, then loop back until lock is equal to zero. Set the lock to one if it's zero. Put something in the buffer, set the lock to zero, and then the consumer takes over and does the exact opposite, essentially. So they're both checking on each other so that only one can enter in the uh, critical region at a time. So from a hardware perspective, we could use a test and a set instruction. We can perform this to check on our local variable, perhaps, that might be stored. The X is the local variable, X is the global register, maybe set to zero initially, and then we flip it, zero to one, zero, or we set a set, and then we test it, test it and not set it, and then we exchange in terms of the exchange, we swap the value of X and R um, so that we can basically do the same thing that we would do with a mutex, which is going to be the next one from an operating system's perspective. We hold a, a value in a variable, and it's either on or off. So it's, we're either going to be allowing the instruction or not allowing the instruction. So. Some hardware mutual exclusive characteristics from an advantage point of view, it can be used by a single or a multiple process with shared memory. Simple and therefore easy to, to verify. It can support multiple critical sections. 
Disadvantage busy waiting is used. Uh, so from a hardware perspective, we still have a busy waiting because whether we're looking at something within the code or from a you know from a hardware or wherever it's located, it doesn't really matter. We're still waiting and we're still you know we're busy checking and waiting, we're not really getting anything done. Also, starvation is possible if we uh, are sitting in there in a circular wait for too long or a busy wait condition for too long. So we're going to be starved because we're not going to be able to get any processing time. And then deadlock is also possible, especially with priorities. So one process might be blocking another process from running indefinitely. Another hardware mutual exclusion <coughs> um, approach would be disabling interrupts. So on a single CPU, only one process is executed. Uh, and then we have concurrency that's achieved by interleave, interleaving the execution. I <coughs> usually done using uh, interrupts. So we can set the environment. So if you disable interrupts, then you can, uh, you can be sure that only one process will execute at one time. One process can lock a system or uh, degrade performance greatly. So. Now through the uh, operating system perspective, and then let me go back to the hardware just to say one last kind of thing. Most of it's done by the operating system. Um, nowadays everything is done by operating system supports um, in terms of the mutual exclusion. Um, if it's an application level, if you're talking about an application level programming, you can set some from a kernel perspective. It's not, uh, it's one of the options that you can possibly do. So, Through an operating system perspective, we have semaphores and message passing, <coughs> which is going to be a, me a message exchange or a direct communication approach. In terms of the semaphore, major advancements were incorporated in many of the modern operating systems. In fact, Unix, I guess, would be the one. OS, OS2, not so popular anymore, but Unix would be the one that would be around that would be supporting this. A semaphore is a non-negative integer, has two value operations associated with it, which is going to be an on or an off kind of approach. So. We can wait on the semaphore, we can signal the semaphore to wake up and start processing. So what we're doing is essentially with the semaphore is creating a block. And we can wait on the block or we can signal that blocking the process to wake up and exchange and put the other one to sleep. Uh, so it's sort of a <coughs> process level control over the processes and their scheduling that's closely tied from an operating system instead of from a programmer application level. You can create semaphores from an application level. You don't have to rely upon semaphore libraries and mutexes and things from an operating system perspective. <coughs> so there's two types of semaphores, the binary one, which is an on or an off. Or there's the counting semaphore, and may have any number of uh, any non-integer values. If they're going to be accounting, they're going to be more than one, usually process that's being synchronized. So you've got a kind of like the Actually, it's sort of like traffic light when we have three states, red, yellow, and green. So when it's kind of in the middle, so we can prepare processes to wake the process up. And we can actually kind of synchronize things a little faster that way, which is actually why they do use it with the traffic light. Because something just can't stop, but if it's yellow, <coughs> we can shut it down gracefully and let it uh, you know, consume other resources or do something else while it's waiting for a resource. Let another process run. So semaphores are an operating system service that's implemented using one of the methods shown or that uh, I've shown you already. Uh, usually by disabling interrupts or for a very short time. Uh, here's an example of uh, initiating a semaphore. I'm going to call it a mutex. And let's say the mutex is, is one. Our consumer producer model, same thing I showed you at the beginning of the lecture where we wait on a mutex. When we're allowed to run, we put something into a shared buffer, and this is the critical section. That's what the CS stands for in the middle of these two processes. And these are two processes. One's the consumer, oops, consumer, one's the producer. <coughs> and the producer will always wait for the consumer. The consumer will always wait for the producer to finish. And they're basically flipping between a wait, put something in the buffer, signal, to the consumer, hey, you can run now, and it goes to sleep. So the signal t tells the other process to run and put me to sleep, and then wait if there, there's a wait going on, and okay, so get something from the buffer, then signal, okay, you can consume it now, or you can produce it now, and back and forth. So. Where it says the mutex is originally set is one, it, flips, it can flip, it can be one, it can be zero, like a binary, or it can go from any number. You can go from 0, 1, 2, 3, or it could be a counting mutex as well. 
So there are three, three processes, maybe. This is where the counting actually comes into play. If uh, we have two processes, we usually use a binary and on and off. It's like a wait or run type of execution. When we have three of them, we can play around with it a little bit more. And here's another example where we have three processes that all share a resource on which one draws an A, one draws a B, and one draws a C in terms of the example. So it's implemented in the form of synchronization so that the output is A, B, and C. So we have a think, draw A, think, draw B, think, draw C. We can synchronize their behavior by going, you know, semaphore B is equal to zero, semaphore C is equal to zero. Well, that means A can run. You know, A would be equal to one. And then uh, they're both going to tell each other A is going to tell B to wait, who's going to tell C to wait, and so forth. So it's basically a way of using a, a semaphore to keep track of who's running and who's not running. And the semaphore and the mutex, just so you're familiar with the concept, are coming from operating system call interfaces. So it's the system call interface to the operating system <clears throat> that's providing you with that functionality. So, so we have three semaphores uh, in this particular bounded buffer problem. So we need a semaphore mutex, a mutual exclusion on the buffer access. We need a semaphore full to synchronize producer and consumer on the number of consumable items. And then a semaphore empty, basically saying it's empty, it's full, which is a three-state, it's a three-state uh, process. Um, and the empty is going to say that we synchronize the producer and consumer ends on the number of empty spaces, and we're all empty now. And the code would look something like, uh, you know, in terms of the logic, the shared data would be. Think of these as, you know, maybe three separate semaphores, which is what they are, three separate call them variables. I really call it a semaphore because it's it's not stored like a variable. The operating system is keeping track of it. So. Initially a full would be zero, empty would be n, and mutex would be equal to one. And then the code for it would look something like this. Would there there be a do loop, do while or something um, where it says produce an item in the next um, you know in next TP transaction processing. Wait, 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 produce another item wait, signal, wait, run. Um, so essentially taking those mutex values of full empty and mutex to signal when to run, when the buffer's full, when the buffer's empty. So you're getting and keeping track of the different states. So that would be what the producer would be doing, would be producing the item. The consumer's going to be removing an item from the buffer. So get the next C and uh, consume the next C. Uh, if it's going to consume it, it has to do something with it. So it's going to go through a process of waiting and then you know, wait on a full, wait on a mutex, signal on a mutex, signal on an empty, and then essentially iterate through. So notes on the bounded buffer solution for the remarks from the consumer's point of view. Putting a signal empty into the critical section of the consumer instead of the outside has no effect since the producer must always wait for all the semaphores before the proceeding. So in terms of if you were going to sort of rejuggle everything, it doesn't make any sense. The consumer must also perform a wait before the wait on the full before a wait on the mutex. Otherwise, a deadlock is going to occur between the consumer who enters into the critical section while the uh, buffer is empty. Because if the consumer enter, enters into the critical section, the buffer is empty, it might just sit there and wait, which is going to cause a deadlock situation. Because it's in this critical section, but it has nothing to consume. So that's why the empty is needed. So if it's empty, don't go into the critical section because you're not going to be very successful. So the conclusion using semaphores is difficult art. Yes, I like the little note on the bottom. It's not what I'd call the most pleasant programming experience using the semaphore libraries. So there's a lot of undergraduate courses in networking and also in Unix that require you to do thread processing and implement semaphores for inter-process communication and solve and process communication issues. It's actually a handy skill to have. Not quite the easiest thing to do. It's very problematic. So. so deadlock. Going back to the concept of process deadlock or system deadlock. Two different concepts actually. We ever know what a deadlock is. There's two or more processes waiting for something that's never going to happen. So process is deadlocked and is waiting on an event which will never happen. So in terms of the system deadlock, the system is deadlocked when one or more processes 
are deadlocked. So if we have one or more processes deadlocked, it doesn't necessarily create a system deadlock, but it creates system issues. Because we have CPU time that's being allocated to these processes to run them, but the processes aren't running. So we basically have a system that's not running either, if you think about the concept. So one doesn't necessarily cause the system deadlock, but the effect is shown by the system as well. It's not just those processes that are affected. The entire system is going to be affected by it. Necessary conditions for a deadlock. Well, we have to have mutual exclusion on something. So some shared resources that are used in a mutually exclusive way. And we're going to need a hold and wait condition. So processes hold on to resources they already have while waiting for an allocation of other resources that they don't have will cause off. The hold and wait will cause off a situation as well of deadlock. We might have also a situation of no preemption where we have resources that cannot be preempted until the process releases them. Preemption is another word for stopping. So if we have non-preemptive, that means we have processes we can't stop. <laughs> if we can't stop the process, well, not only are we going to get deadlock, we're going to end up with starvation at the same time as well because swap processes will just be running and running and running and not allowing any other process to run. Or we may end up with a concept of the circular weight that occurs, circular weights, the chain of processes, which exists in which each process holds on to resources wanted by the next process, and it's in a chain. So. It's the dining philosopher's actual problem. And that's a classic IPC situation where you sit down five or six different, you know, this is the way the problem scenario goes. You sit down five or six different philosophers in a circle, and they have chopsticks, and there's an uneven number of chopsticks, and then they pick up the, or it's a fork or a knife, depending upon where you read the example from. <laughs> they pick up, and they need to get one of each. So there's going to be an odd number. So... They, none of them actually ever get, you can't get the whole table to have one of each if you don't have an even set. So some will wait, but nobody will put anything down. So if they don't let go of it and they have the wrong pair, you have deadlocked, deadlocked processes because nobody's releasing any resource. They're all waiting for somebody else to release the resource. And you, they don't have the right number of resources. You know, they have two forks. Or they have two knives. Or they don't have anything. They're short one of the items. So... That's what the circular wait is all about, actually. They're all waiting for somebody else, and that person's waiting for somebody else, and that person's waiting for somebody else. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, who was supposed to bring the such and such? And they're all waiting for somebody else to bring it, but nobody actually brought it or something. So, No deadlock situation. If you can prevent at least one of the necessary deadlock conditions, then you will never have a deadlock. Well, that's the theory. But, you know, operating systems still deadlock. In fact, most of the operating system... Deadlock avoidance techniques slow down the operating system. So instead of slowing it down, you create a situation where if it occurs, you can deal with it. And it's called, uh, you know, when it happens, you know, mitigate the damages. Or just let it happen and see how often it's going to happen. And maybe it won't happen that often. This is the ostrich algorithm. Pretend there is no problem. You know, the ostrich puts his head in the sand, <laughs> hides this is what most of our operating systems are doing these days. Let's pretend we'd never have a deadlock problem. So, a deadlock problem actually does occur occasionally, but it doesn't occur enough because we've designed the system to avoid the concept. So it's reasonable that deadlocks occur very rarely, and the cost of the prevention is high, which means it would be very uh, time-consuming to have an algorithm run in the background to check for the deadlock. So instead of checking for it, instead of preventing it, recovering from it, we just ignore it completely. So that's why we have windows that say waiting. <laughs> or we have windows that don't load correctly. Or we have, you know, just occasional, that's because you, you had something and the system didn't deal with it. But if the user's uh, willing and you know, able to move on from that, reboot their computer or do something, you know, that situation occurs. And if it doesn't occur that often, why bother, essentially? Um, so Windows and Unix also takes this approach. Everybody takes the approach. So the trade-off is between convenience and correctness. It's more convenient, less correct. And here are those deadlock handling techniques I was talking about. Ways of avoiding deadlocks. So the first approach is to ignore it completely. Okay, so if you're not going to ignore it completely, you're going to put in a way of avoiding it. You can put in pre 
preventative you know, techniques in there, prevention, where you're not creating a situation where two processes can enter into a critical section. So instead, you're making it so the deadlock is never going to happen. You're preventing any situation where it could. Um, the other one is let it happen, but detect it, and then shut down the processes that are causing the deadlock. So you're detecting it, and you are essentially, you know, making sure that, you know, when it does get found, you're cleaning up the mess. Or we've got avoidance, which is different from prevention. Avoidance is, it's possible, it can happen, we haven't prevented it, but we're going to avoid situations. So we're going to put rules in so that users can't load more than five programs. Or put rules in to avoid the, poss the possibility of something we haven't prevented from happening from happening. And then we have the recovery, which means let it happen, recover, let it happen, and constantly recover from it. So you're putting an aging, let's say, on a deadlock process, and it's aging, and you're recovering from the aging. So that's if you're going to implement it. The reason why nobody implements it, it's time consuming. It cuts down. If, if Windows actually implemented or if Unix implemented deadlock avoidance for the operating system, you'd probably get about half the speed you normally get from the operating system. Not very efficient. It would be like, you know, having a really bad scheduler. Well, it would be a bad scheduler because you wouldn't be able to schedule processes to run. Everyone, every time somebody runs, are you going to conflict with that one? Are you going to conflict with that one? I mean, it's way too much overhead. So, so I'm going to go through uh, each one of these in a little bit more detail. I'll just gave you the summary of it, but the deadlock prevention <coughs> remove the possibility of the deadlock, as I mentioned, occurring by denying one or more of the following conditions from occurring, well, we're going to have mutual exclusion. Can we share everything? Not really. <laughs> so sometimes we can't predict the mutual exclusion issue. It might be with a file. It might be with a shared resource of some sort. We can implement a hold and a wait, perhaps, or maybe have no preemption or maybe a circular wait, which are some of the ways that we can uh, basically prevent the deadlock. In terms of denying the hold and the wait, we're going to release things. So in terms of the implementation, a process is given a resource, resource on an all or none basis. So if they don't have everything they need and they can't run, they can't process, they got to put back. They have to release all the resources they're not using. So either the process gets all its required resources and proceeds or it gets none of them and waits until it can get some of the resources. Some advantages to the hold and the wait it works, reasonable and easy to code. It's not too difficult. Problems, it's a little bit of resource waste, wastage. And possibility of starvation. Because if you're constantly putting down, picking up, putting down, picking up, you, know, you could be wasting resources in terms of checking for the resources. And then you could cause a starvation where one process keeps holding and waiting, holding and waiting, and not allowing anybody else essentially to run or not, not allowing anyone to proceed. So denying the non-preemption, which means if we make it so we can't interrupt, preemptive processes can be interrupted. Not preemptive processes, can't, you can't stop them or interrupt them. They have to run until they're done, which causes an issue sometimes, I think, um, in terms of the implementation. So to deny, to not use a non, no preemptive, and to preempt. So when the process is refused, a resource request, it must release all of the resources it holds, and it has to go away. It has to stop. So resources can be removed from a process before it is finished with them. So. Advantages. It works. <coughs> Possible. Better resource utilization. Problems with it. The cost of removing a process's resource might be a little bit high. Process is likely to lose work that it has done. You know, if you're like in the middle of doing something and said, you know, even if you were a person and you were preempted, you know, you have to go back and find out, well, what did I do when before you stopped me? You know, I was downloading a bunch of stuff. I have to start all that work over again. You know, so you're going to lose where you're at. You're going to you lose resources. It's more time consuming. You're going to run a little bit slower if people keep interrupting you. <laughs> so, versus if you're just allowed to run. So the process is likely to lose work. Okay. How often does this occur? Well, it depends on how often you're going to actually preempt the process. If you're not preempting that much, it's only a small case, then you won't have, end up with a you know, bad situation where processes can't, uh, you know, are constantly losing work. 
And you also have the possibility of starvation that goes along with that. So we can deny the circular weight condition to avoid the deadlock in terms of the implementation. Resources are uniquely numbered. We're keeping track of the resources. The processes can only request resources in a linear ascending order. And uh, those preventing the circular weight, thus present, prevent, preventing the circular weight from occurring because we only have to do them in ascending or descending order and we can't just randomly request a process. So we basically order everybody up and you can only get them in a certain order so you can't wait essentially for something that somebody else is waiting for and be blocked and end up in a deadlock situation. Advantages, it works. Disadvantages or problems to it. Resources must be requested in ascending order. We actually have to put a number on the processes and order them. Um, so it's on order rather than on need. So some of the processes that have a higher priority for certain resources aren't going to get them because they're essentially stuck. And they're, they're, the, the priority is a little bit off based. And then resource numbering uh, must be maintained by something or someone to reflect every one of the additional addition to the operating system. So you have overhead in keeping track of the resource numbers. You have an extra table that's keeping track of the order and organizing the order and uh, of who's requesting which resource and that entire algorithm is going to add overhead. And it might be difficult to sit down and write the code essentially. Code actually for a circular weight is going to be kind of difficult. So. The deadlock avoidance as another technique. Allow the chance of the deadlock, let it occur but avoid it from happening in some situations by the overall design. You can also check whether the next state or change in the system may end up in a deadlock situation and then not allow it. The more checking that you're doing, the more overhead you're adding to the system, the harder you're going to make it, essentially, to, to perform. Actually, it's not really the harder, the slower you're going to make it. It's going to perform. So, so let's take a look at another algorithm. It's called the Banker's Algorithm. So this is what I call a more advanced kind of thing. It really does work with resource uh, resource allocation. So the definition. So we all know what banks do. They loan money out to people. And then people go in, they borrow money, and then people go in and they put money back. They pay back their loan. Or they have money that they want to buy CDs and they put in bank accounts so they can spend it and stuff like that. Or save it. <laughs> Saving the account. Uh, so we have a shared resource, which is the bank. And then we have people who are borrowing money and then people who are contributing money to the system. So each process has a loan, a claim, and a maximum need. So the loan is the current number of resources held. The maximum need is the total number of resources needed to complete. And how much do they need to borrow? And then the claim is the maximum minus the load. So we can keep track of this shared resource sort of like this, where we have consumer number one and we have consumer number two. Consumer number one needs a maximum of $800. The present loan that they have is $410. The claim is $390. So suppose a bank, bank capital is $1,000. Current cash is $410 plus $210. Present loan is going to be $380. That number is wrong. It should say $380 on it, not $390. It's a typo in the slide, actually. I've been meaning to fix this, but I didn't do it. If I did fix it, I don't know how the old one got put in here. That number should be 380 and not 390. <laughs> so, which is the share? Which is the current cash? The claim. So, C1 <coughs> can't withdraw everything it needs from the claim. Neither can C2. So, if one of them did it, it's going to starve the other one. Um, or if they're both trying to do it at the same time, they're going to deadlock because neither one of those transactions is going to work because the claim value isn't big enough. If this number was $1,000 here, it'd be perfect. We'd have enough. But when does a bank ever have enough money for everybody? So should. But the concept is, you know, make money on loaning it <laughs> and then pay off a little bit on accepting it, but you have to accept it in order to loan it. Otherwise, your balance isn't going to come out correctly. So here's some assumptions that establishing a loan ceiling maximum need for each one of the processes might make it so you can schedule a number of processes to all work together with a fixed maximum need. Maximum need might be smaller than the total number of resources available. That is the capital that's in the shared bank. So the total loans for a process must be less than or equal to the maximum need. Loan resources must be returned. 
back somehow in some sort of a finite time. So we need to know, we need to be able to predict when the money is going to come back. That's why banks set loans with repayment plans and they calculate the repayment plan because they know when the money is going to come back because as soon as you return it, somebody else is going to take it. So the next consumer is already in line to take the money that you're giving back to the bank. If you think about it, what does banking do? A bunch of consumers are all sharing money amongst themselves. At any one moment, the bank should not have any funds, really. It should all be out. And they're, they're making money on the transaction of it going from one person to the other through the bank, of course. So there's an implementation of the banker's algorithm. <coughs> so you search for the process with a claim that can be satisfied using the current number of remaining resources that tentatively grant the claim. Say, so, okay, you need 200, we have 390 or 380, we have enough. Um, okay, so tentatively we're going to grant you the, the claim. If such a process is found, then assume that it will return the loan resources. When the loan resources are returned, the next process gets to use it. So repeat the steps for all processes and then mark them. Don't grant a claim if at least one process cannot be marked. So you set the order of all the different processes in the sequence of claimed events. And then if it works out in that order and everyone gets essentially the claim, then you've properly juggled all the money to give it out to people in a sort of a consistent order sequentially. In terms of the implementation, the resource request is only allowed if the result is safe. So at every time a new person comes into the system and requests resources, their balance has to be checked, their system has to be checked with the, all the other resources. So that would be like the loan application process. It's actually kind of time consuming if you think about it because we have to check to see if the other uh, processes that are also requesting to borrow money that their basic states can be satisfied as well. The system is always maintained in a safe state to eventually all requests hopefully can be fulfilled. So some advantages of this allow the jobs to proceed when the uh, prevention algorithm wouldn't. Problems with it requires there to be a fixed number of resources. Yeah. And how do you know if it's fixed? <laughs> It might be changing. What happens if the resource go, grows down? It goes down, and we're gonna not, the algorithm is not going to work right. Or it doesn't allow the process to change its maximum need while processing. And then we're going to end it with an issue. So here are some other inter-process communication, and they call them classic problems. Because these are the classic scenarios uh, for which inter-process communication is needed. If we don't control the inter-process communication, in these particular scenarios, we end up with the issues of starvation with deadlock or circular weights and all the other things I've talked about. So the readers and the writers problem. The model is the access to a database. So we both read and write to the same. We have the diner philosophers problem. I'm going to go through each one of these in a little bit more detail, one, one or two slides each to sum this up. That's the model of it for exclusive access to a limited number of resources, such as I.O. devices. And then we have the sleeping barber problem. The model's queuing. So we have a queuing situation, uh, multiple person help desk, uh, maybe a computerized call center, or call waiting system, or a hold system. So the readers and the writers. Any number of readers and activities, reader activities and writer activities might be running at any one moment. This is um, <coughs> the database. So if you think about the concept, you have a live database. You're going to have a reader-writer problem that needs to be solved in terms of your implementation. Because so many people are going to read values from the database, and then they're going to write values back out to the database. So you have to synchronize the reading and the writing if you're going to end up with some sort of a consistency or some sort of guaranteed end result that's going to make sense. Otherwise, your database is going to have bad data in it. So anytime the reader activity may wish to read any data, the writer activity may also want to write something out. And uh, in terms of databases, they call it concurrency control. And they may also refer to it as transaction management or transaction control. It's a reader's writer's problem from a classic operating system scenario. So during the time the reader is writing, no other reader or writer may access the shared database, shared data. So here's an interesting, so here's the access to the database here, and we've got a bunch of readers. It's okay if we have multiple readers reading a value. It's all going to be the same value. As soon as one writer comes in and wants to change the value, all the readers have to stop reading, and then they have to get new values. 
So the readers can't be reading while the writers are writing simultaneously because the value is going to be wrong. So then every time a writer writes, it has to wait. And, and then when it waits, all of these guys have to wait for the writer before they can actually get a value. So reader can enter, writer waits. So the waiting, the entering and then the waiting is the process synchronization that's going on. Um, and you, you know, you could probably implement it with a, using a mutex or something or a semaphore to keep track of it. And so the reader's waiting while the writer's writing. So here we had multiple readers. Here we have one writer. So one writer at a time, multiple readers possible. Makes the database sufficient. If we had it with a one and one, it would be very slow. But multiple reads is fine. Uh, should the readers wait for the writer, waiting writer? They should. Uh, so the writer must wait until it enters when all of the readers leave. If the reader waits, then we have a faster execution. If we synchronize, and basically what we're doing in this particular reader writer is synchronizing all of the different processes by what they're doing. If they're writing, then they should wait, maybe, or the readers should wait for the writers. So, so the first reader writer problem requires that no reader be kept waiting until the writer has obtained access to the shared data. The second one, the readers and the writer problems, requires that once a writer is ready, no reader can start reading because they're going to get the wrong value. And in the, in the solution to the first case, writers may starve. In the solution to the second case, the readers are going to starve. So we're going to have some starvation that occurs at one point. In terms of the reader-writer solution to implement this type of scenario from an operating systems perspective, these are some of the things that we would have. We would have a read counter, and read count would keep track of the number of processes currently reading. If nobody's reading, you know, it would be zero. And mutex would provide a mutex mutual exclusion for updating the read count. And then the write, essentially, and some for providing mutual exclusion for the writers. It's also used for the last, first or the last reader that enters in or exits out of the critical section. And we have the dining philosopher's problem, moving right along to another classic problem. This one I explained kind of briefly already, but to give you the full definition of it, we have five philosophers that are sitting around a circular table, and they're, in front of a, they're sitting in front of a bowl of rice, so there's two different variations. You have the Italian version, where they're sitting in front of spaghetti, and they have a fork and a spoon, or a fork and a knife. And then you have the rice scenario, where they're eating rice with chopsticks. This one's going to have the rice one. So between each pair of uh, people, there are chopsticks, or a fork. So there are five chopsticks, hmm, five chopsticks, or one short. So it takes two chopsticks, or forks, to eat rice. So while n is eating, neither n plus 1 or n minus 1 can eat, which means, well, this guy is eating, this guy can't eat, and that guy can't eat. <laughs> so one can eat, but two have to wait. So, and then that's why they call it the dining philosophers, because they're sitting there thinking in between their eating, because they can't all eat at the same time. So some of them have to think. They don't have to. They probably want to think if they're philosophers. So. Each one thinks for a while gets the chopsticks that, that, that's needed, eats, and then puts the chopsticks back down in an endless cycle. So, that actually might be a kind of a fun idea to do. Uh, unfortunately, I think people would be fighting over the chopsticks and not putting them down, especially the hungry philosophers. They're not going to put the chopsticks down. <laughs> and then you, have, then you have starvation, in, in the truest sense. <laughs> so, which, is a, which is starvation, by definition, actually, when the philosophers won't put the chopsticks down until they're done with it. Um, illustrates the difficulty of allocating resources among processes without deadlock and starvation. Challenges to grant the request for the chopsticks while avoiding deadlock and starvation. It causes both. A deadlock could occur if everybody picked them up. You're going to have a deadlock between two of the processes, the one who didn't get any and the one who's got it mismatched. One has one. Um, with the chopstick scenario, though, it's two of the same resources. You could complicate the scenario by making it a knife and a fork. And then you end up with two forks or two knives, which might actually end up being a problem. But the scenario is not supposed to work that way. It's supposed to work with a left and a right guaranteed to be of different, different types. Or in the case of chopsticks, the same. So it gets the left chopstick if it's stuck because the right chopstick, uh, somebody else has got the left chopstick. So Usually what you want to do is make sure you got a matching set. If you don't have a matching set, put it back down so that some other process can get a matching set. That way you can get everybody out. Um, so. 
Each philosopher is a process, process PI. You repeat one philosopher per fork, create multiple philosophers. First attempt to deadlock. Deadlock if the philosopher starts by picking up his left fork, his left chopstick. If they're all picking up in the left direction, you're going to hit deadlock while everybody picks it up. So you change the order. You change the order. Here's the fork and the knife. Don't starve yourself. It says on the bottom here. <laughs> you can starve other people. <laughs> it's a possible solution to avoid the deadlock. Allow at most four philosophers to be sitting at the table at one time instead of five. Which is kind of a human scenario. You go into a restaurant and you don't have enough chairs, then only the people with chairs are going to sit at that table until you bring some a, another chair over. So you add another resource to the pool in order to occupy the resource. In an operating system, you're not going to pull a chair over. You're going to use whatever resources is there. And you're going to be limited in the number that and is going to be safe, which is an avoidance technique. Odd number of philosophers pick up the left fork first, and the even one picks up the right fork, so we can have everyone not doing the same direction in a circular fashion. So weaknesses of semaphores, which is all of these are actually implemented in terms of a semaphore, uh, or they can be from an operating system perspective. Uh, the user is expected to write, wait, and signal in the right order. If they don't, your semaphore is useless, because you're not going to be essentially using it in the right order. The user must remember to execute the signal for each one of the exits. Calls may be spread out throughout the entire program. The logic may demand that the process will check and signal his peers. Uh, may also check and signal in the wrong order. So review the logic of the dining philosopher's, philosopher's solution. And you'll kind of see how the order of the implementation is very specific. And that's where most of the problems are going to turn out with. Because, um, you know, if you send everybody to wait, everyone's going to be waiting. If you're not waiting and writing in the right process, in the right order, you're going to end up in a situation where it's not synchronized, although you're trying to. So there's been a wide number of alternatives, uh, approaches to this. Monitors are one common approach. Um, a monitor, by definition, and here's the kind of the last of the vocabulary I'm going to give you on this. A new language construct that includes synchronization. Monitors are part of Java, so you implement in Java via the synchronized keyword. So in terms of a method invocation, if you say synchronize, it's going to automatically do your process synchronization for you, which is why this is a lot easier to be done in modern day operating systems like you know, Java. And in fact, it's the Java virtual machine environment that's doing the synchronization for you that's really much acting like an operating system, because it is an operating system. So. The JVM is an operating system that rides on top of an operating system. <laughs> so in theory, it's operating system controlled. So we have the monitors and the synchronized method, or excuse me, synchronized keyword that's used with the method. So only one process can enter a monitor used for entry points. And for example, a compiler might generate um, a call to a common semaphore on an entry, signal and exit. So let's take a look to see what it looks like. Here's the code for it. We would uh, say public synchronize, void withdrawal, public synchronize, void deposit. So we have two methods, a deposit and a withdrawal. And they're synchronized, which means it's not going to allow these processes to deadlock or to start each other. It will break it up automatically and be controlled automatically by the operating system. So over the years, process synchronization has become a lot easier. <laughs> if you're still using C or C++, to implement inter-process communication, you're not going to have a keyword like this that's going to impose a, a monitor, and you're not going to be able to have any operating system support over it, especially on a Windows platform. But on a Windows platform, you can't program with threads, so you don't have to have that problem, actually. So the only way you can program with threads on Windows is to use Java, essentially, and uh, you run it through the JVM. So You can program with threads on Unix and Linux environments, however. And that becomes actually quite easy. If you're familiar and with a lot of practice, I should say. It's not one of the easiest programming things to, to take into consideration. So the equivalents, monitors and semaphores have equivalent power. A monitor in Java is a semaphore in Unix. It's about the same concept. Anything uh, you can do in monitors, you can do with semaphores. Proof we can implement a monitor with a semaphore, actually. Anything that you can do with semaphores, you can do with monitors. 
You can implement a semaphore using a monitor. It's really the same concept, actually. So I'm going to give you some summary in terms of uh, our inter-process communication. So we've seen two problems, the critical sections, where we uh, can't have both by modifying a variable. Um, and we have synchronization that uh, must define an order. So there's ordering to the processes that are running. Often uh, problems are combinations of the two. Combinations of the two would be, let's say, the reader and the writer. Maybe from, from shared storage, the reader should wait. Um, if there's a writer writing, the writer needs to wait. So the database scenario actually gives us a combination um, of a lot of different problems. Difficulty is some enforced correctly. There's been language support for monitors. It's not standard in Unix. It's only supported in Java. So still only supports semaphores themselves. So. That was everything you ever wanted to know, as I promised. I was going to finish that up and then start in with CPU scheduling. Uh, but that, then all I'm going to get through like the first part of this. I'll just cover the first part, then next time I'll continue with CPU scheduling. But that was everything that could possibly, well, I would say 90% of inter-process communication issues. If you wanted to take it a step further, you could look at different types of application domains and different types of operating systems and look specifically at what they're supporting. But for the purposes of a general operating systems course, I've given you the classic inter-process communication models. So, CPU scheduling. If I can get through what this is today, that would be very good because then you'll think about it for a week and then next week I'll cover the schedule of techniques. So this really is a two-part lecture. Uh, but to start out with the concept, I'm going to give you the basic concepts of what CPU scheduling is about, scheduling criteria, algorithms. I'm not going to get through all this today. Multiple process scheduling, real-time scheduling, thread scheduling, Java threads, algorithm evaluation. Here's the basic concept. We want to maximize the CPU utilization obtained through multi-programming. We have a single processor system. Oh, let me rephrase that. We have an operating system that works with a single processing system. Right? Let's talk about Microsoft Windows for, for a few minutes. Um, on a single processor, not a dual, well, it could be a single chip or it could be two chips working together to form the concept of a single process. Only one instruction can perform at one time. So. We have multiple processes running. So CPU scheduling is all about which process is going to run next. <laughs> so we're looking at a shared resource. A shared resource is the CPU. Processes need to use this, the, the, this shared resource. And in the process scheduling, uh, we're looking at the use of registers. We're looking at the use of a, a bunch of queues or hash tables. We're looking at sort of, the, you know, a lot of data structures associated with this. We're also looking at a, an underlying core algorithm that's going to determine our scheduling routine. And our scheduling routine should be fast, at the very minimum. Who wants a slow-running computer? Nobody does. <laughs> so, as you could probably say that the strength and the speed of an operating system is found and improved through the CPU scheduler. Because it doesn't really matter how much memory you have on the computer. It doesn't really matter how big your hard drive is. It doesn't matter how many registers you have. It doesn't really matter. And nothing really matters except for how fast your processing is going. <laughs> Which is why people spend a lot of money to upgrade their processor chip or they buy new computers every couple of years to get the faster processor. That's all fine and dandy, but if the program that's using the processor, which is the operating system, if it's not doing a good job, it's not doing a good job. As an example, Windows Vista had a terrible scheduler. <laughs> Actually, XP's wasn't really that good. It was improved. It's the same scheduler as improved in 7. They improved it. So Windows 7 will run faster. If you take... The only problem with Windows 7 is you need higher... You need, you need better, different types of resources. If you have the resources that will support Windows 7 on your computer, you have the architecture it's designed for 7. You take that and downgrade it to XP, you're going to get a slower CPU scheduler. That's why in 7 you can back compatible to XP, but you're still using the 7 scheduler. You certainly don't want to use anything below that, because the farther you go back, the slower the scheduler, the more buggy the scheduler, the more problems you had. 
with the operating system. So throughout the years, the scheduler itself has improved significantly. It's gotten to a point where it's noticeably faster than it ever used to be. And it doesn't have anything to do with scheduling algorithms. don't have anything to do with the speed of your processor. You can have an extremely fast processor with a really slow scheduler and come out with a really slow computer. <laughs> Which is kind of interesting. Because people like computers with multiple processes on them, unless and Windows 7 supports multiple processes, unless you've got an operating system that's going to support the second core that you have on there, you're not going to see it. You know, it's not even going to be used. It just sits there and grows dust on the board, essentially. Depends on the architecture. But if they're, if they're wired together and they're running as one unit, they'll be used. If they're not, you actually have a true dual core system and you don't have an operating system that's supporting it, why are you running it on that hardware? It's going to run the same speed on different hardware, which is kind of interesting. Because the operating system has to be able to use the scheduler, excuse me, use the CPU and apply it to a scheduler. So we have CPU I.O. burst cycles. So the process of execution consists of a cycle of CPU burst and then an I.O. wait. And then we have CPU burst distribution. Distributing CPU burst among all of the available processes who are waiting for it. Here we go. Here's the alternative sequence for CPU and I.O. burst. We have a CPU burst, an I.O. burst, a CPU burst, an I.O. burst, a CPU burst, an I.O. burst. We're running more wide and more and we have I.O. burst and CPU burst. Nothing runs simultaneously. <laughs> the CPU starts, the process gets some CPU time, it leaves the CPU, it goes into a wait queue for I.O. It waits for the I.O., it gets its I.O. What is I.O.? Any other resource outside of the CPU is in the I.O. category. So the hard drive, the memory, the registers, the I any of the I.O. ports, like the USB port, the CD-ROM drive, uh, anything that's a resource is an I.O. category. CPU is just CPU, which is kind of interesting. So in terms of the instructions here, as we go through a list of instructions, we shift. And the sequence of events makes a shift between, and a burst is nothing more than amount of time. It's usually uh, measured in clock ticks. So the burst can be, you know, X clock ticks. And then these bursts can be of different lengths. Your CPU bursts are going to be much shorter than your I.O. bursts because there's more frequently requested CPU requests than there are I.O. requests. Think about it. Does everything you do have something to do with I.O.? No. If you're a process and you're in the system, most likely you're going to need some initial CPU burst. You're going to need a, you know, you're going to need CPU burst after CPU burst. So you can kind of think of the CPU bursts, the CPU routing as sort of the traffic cop. You well, know, everyone goes, it's kind of like going to the DMV. You all go to the counter, you get a number. <laughs> That's the CPU, <laughs> and then you wait with your number for your I/O. That's the waiting. So we all know the CPU at the uh, the DMV doesn't run that quickly. So. <laughs> Here's a histogram of CPU burst times. So the frequency of the burst, meaning how fast are you going to get it, is higher. Frequency is higher. We also have the burst duration is going to be uh, equivalent. You know, there's this, there's a histogram here with a high. So the low is giving you a low duration. The high is giving you a big duration in terms of the frequency. Um, so basically, you want essentially to synchronize the processes in terms of how much CPU time they're getting, how frequently they're getting it, and the less frequently they're getting it, the more time you want to give it to them. The more frequently they're getting it, you're going to wait, you're going to hold them back a little bit. Because if, if otherwise you're going to end it with starvation. And the reason why I like to go through the deadlock, the starvation, <laughs> circular waiting and all this other stuff is because it really does apply to CPU scheduling. Because the most you know commonly asked question is what are we scheduling? Processes. <laughs> the threat of execution in the computer in the operating system is the process. CPU scheduler is scheduling those processes. Processes are going to conflict with each other. We're going to have interprocess issues that the scheduler is going to cause 
if we all go to the same queue. So you design the scheduler to be fair in terms of processing time for the CPU and also for IO bursts for each one of the processes. So what is a scheduler? It selects amongst the processes in memory that are already executing and allocates CPU time to one of them. So one of them is going to get CPU time first. So what we have is a process control block, which is a data structure, usually a hash table that's located in the kernel memory that keeps track of all of the processes that are running. How does one get in there? You double click on an icon, it runs an exe file. The program that was stored now became a process. It's now being in, in the process control block. We've got its start time, how much CPU time it needs, all this information that's stored about the process. This kernel looks at that and then assigns the process to a scheduler. It says, okay, now you can run. You cannot run. So it picks one out of that CPU at the process control block. CPU scheduler decisions may take, uh, may take place when a process switches from running to waiting state, from running to ready state, from waiting to ready, and also when it terminates because the C actually the kernel has got to remove that process out of the process control block and the CPU scheduler needs to get rid of it if it's already done. So scheduling under 1 and 4 is non-preemptive. So you can't actually preempt, you can't stop a process when it's running. Where are you going to put all of the uh, memory that that process is, um, that temporary memory the process is using in the stack entries and things? Um, well, it's all going to be stored in the process space. So you can preempt the process uh, depending upon what it's doing. And you're running, and you, you can't stop a running process unless you're going to start another running process. Otherwise, you have all the processes stopped and you've got like a dead computer at that point. So all of the other scheduling is preemptive. You can uh, at any one moment in time stop a process. So the dispatcher model gives control to the CPU to the processes selected by the short-term scheduler. This involves a switching context. Do so you guys know what context switching is? Everyone taught, well, you hear a lot in architecture courses too. Context switchers, you know, it's an operating system concept. It means you're switching between running processes. And the context switch time is what affects the efficiency of your algorithm. So if it takes a long time to stop a process, put it back in the process update, update and put it back in the process control block, which it doesn't really go in there, you're just updating the process control block. Select another process and start that process and have that process run, that's your context switch time. Context switching does absolutely nothing but add overhead to your process and because it takes CPU cycles to context switch. So if you're doing a lot of context switching, <laughs> your CPU is doing a lot of nothing. Although the light's on, it's running around, it's doing something, but none of your programs are running because instead of a user mode program running, the kernel is context switching. You can end up with a bad scheduler that has a high context switch overhead where you have nothing really running. So I have a, you know, going back to the processor speed, why have a big processor <laughs> if the CPU is only going to use it to context switch? So switching the context, switching to user mode, jumping to the proper location in the program to restart that program that has currently been running. So you stop a program, you restart it, stop a program. We also have what's called dispatch latency. It's another um, sort of, uh, and the dispatcher is the algorithm <coughs> that's selecting which process out of the process control block is going to uh, essentially get a chance to run. The dispatcher has overhead. Sometimes the dispatcher is actually referred to as the scheduler because it's the routine of selecting which process you're going to run. The dispatch latency is the time that it takes for the dispatcher to stop one process and then start another. That latency is your context switch time. So we have some scheduling criteria. So if we wanted to build a good scheduler, here are some of the things that we would look at. We want 100% CPU utilization. Well, with context switching, we're never going to get that. But we can keep the CPU as busy as possible. So CPU utilization. You can take different algorithms from different operating systems. And I actually had this as one of my assignments in the old days, and then I realized we don't really have that many operating systems to compare anymore. <laughs> it was actually going to, you know, outside of Windows and the OS X, Mac, 
Actually, which one do you think has a faster contact switch? You're saying Mac? <laughs> I think Windows wins that one, actually. <laughs> the switching between that program is a little faster. However, um, I think the Mac's got a better memory management. It has a bigger virtual memory, abstraction logical. It does a mapping better. It makes better, better resource allocation of memory. Have you ever noticed when you start up a Mac, it takes, it actually, well, the current version actually starts a lot faster than the older versions did. But when you load something up initially, it takes longer. <laughs> so it's not as responsive, which means that's, that's part of the latency that you're feeling with a slower scheduler. However, the scheduler uh, doesn't have to work as hard. The Windows scheduler is constantly switching, which is where you get your responsiveness. You click on a minimize icon and you bring it up, it's going to show up faster. There's like they do speed tests on this all the time, or you know, minimize the window, maximize the window. It's always going to load faster on a Windows because it, the scheduler is more responsive. It's actually working the CPU more, theoretically. From whatever literature that I've read on it, the CPU is actually getting more use. <laughs> more, the CPU utilization, and this kind of gets into the concept of what do you mean by CPU utilization in terms of scheduling criteria. It's working harder, which means you'll never hear the fan going off too much on a Mac. Now, Windows systems, oh man, you got heat sinks on that, you got dual fans in the casing, you got, you know, that, that thing is working, it's overclocked, essentially. But on a Mac system, not quite as responsive, but bigger memory mapping, better memory control. So and when it switches, it switches. Like, it, the entire program is available, and you'll have true multi-programming going on. You open up an application and you minimize it, it's still running. It's still working. It's loaded. So, like, you open up your email and you close your email, but it's still loaded. So you get a new email message in, although the application is not in front of you, it, you it's still running. So it, it can actually handle a lot more memory usage, a lot more swapping of the memory, multitasking, and multi-programming is a little bit higher in terms of my critique of it. And, you know, you can take it from many different perspectives in terms of the comparison, but the CPU schedule doesn't run, I don't think it runs as fast from what I've read. I'm convinced it's a little slower. It's a little bit more reliable, but it's slower. Only because Windows is, like, supposed to be thousands of applications all running at the same time simultaneously. So there's a lot more context switching going on. <laughs> so. Throughput, you can measure, and that's, I'm just talking about CPU utilization as a criteria. I could elaborate on my won't on all of these, otherwise we'll be here all night. And you can probably come up with examples in terms of comparison. Throughput is the number of processes that complete their execution per time unit. So you might have a high CPU utilization, a very low throughput. <laughs> Turnaround time may also be the amount of time uh, to execute a particular process. And then wait time, because turnaround time is like, you know, for all processes, one run fast, one run slow. You know, you can do an average. You can also do the turnaround. You can do the wait time, the average amount of time that a process has to be waiting before it got execution. Response time, the amount of time it takes from when a request was submitted until the first response is produced, not output. This is for time sharing environments. Response time on a Mac, I don't think is as fast as on a Windows system. You can see that just by the GUI interface and the way that the GUI, and I think it's because the Mac GUI in general has a lot more loading. It's a bigger, bigger process that's running in terms of the graphic support. So strip it down a little bit, make it smaller, it would probably run at the same speed. In terms of optimization criteria, we want to maximize the CPU utilization, maximize the throughput, minimize turnaround time, minimize wait time, and minimize response time. We have a quick response time, and um, quick, no wait, everything runs simultaneously. And I'm going to go through this first one, and then I'm going to stop. And then when I start up next time, I'm going to go through this first one again and compare it. Because now what I'm getting into is the implementation details. And just to give you an example of what CPU scheduling is, and this is just part of my little overview for today. 
the basic, basic, basic model is the first come, first serve. First come, first serve scheduler. So now what we're looking at are different algorithms to be used, and every operating system uses a different algorithm. Nobody's going to use first come, first serve. <laughs> it's more of a batch processing model. First come, first serve, if you were to take a look at these processes, and we have three processes that show up into the scheduler. These are turns on their computer and three processes run. The burst time for the first process is 24. That means it needs 24 cycles on the uh, CPU. The next one's only three, the next one's only three. But the number one here, the P1, showed up first. <laughs> so the order on the first come, first serve matters. Suppose that the processes arrive in this order. Here's the Gantt chart for the schedule. From 0 to 24, P1 is going to run. From 24 to 27, it only needs 3. Then this guy only needs 3. So the wait time, if we calculate it out, is 27. Average wait time is 17 because this guy had to wait. P2 didn't get to start immediately. He had to wait for 24 to go on. And this guy, this guy didn't have to wait at all, though. This guy just started because he arrived first. And these would be three programs that you're running, and this is the operating system's approach to it. So suppose the process has arrived in a different order. <laughs> P2, P3, and P1. Gantt chart for the scheduler is no wait, no wait, well, three, waits for three, waits for six. The wait time is going to be lower. Wait time now is three. Previous wait time was 27 versus which the first time is just think of it as a calculation for how much CPU time process is going to get. The average wait time is only three compared to 17, which is not too good. Much better than the previous case. This is the convoy effect. Short processes begin long begin be, are behind the long processes. If the pr long process shows up first, this is a bad algorithm. And if the short processes show up first, this is a good algorithm. So you might imagine then, well, why isn't this used? <laughs> How do you know what the user is going to click on? How do you know? From a user processor perspective, you can't predict the order. And then if you do predict the order, you have to constantly reorganize the queue. Take and re reorder, reorder the process. But this is a real-time scheduler. So any moment of time, somebody new could be coming into the system. You've got to compare them with everybody else. A lot of overhead in the organization of this particular list. Uh, so it doesn't make it very efficient. So um, all what I'm going to do next time is actually start with this first come, first serve, because what I'm going to do is go through about five other ones. But it's nice to see the comparison among all of them <laughs> in one shot, one lecture. Otherwise, you got, if I give you the first now, I, I will repeat that, but then you're like, what was that one other one? So I'll wait till next time. Uh, but what we're going to essentially go through is the shortest job first with preemptive, with not preemptive, and then go through the concept of priority queues and uh, priority scheduling, which is what most modern operating systems are doing. They're doing multi-level priority schedulers, where we've got... And priority schedules can be doing a round robin. They can be doing uh, any any number of different types. But uh, this is the one here I'm going to get to next lecture. Multi multi level queue with multiple different priorities. Because if you think about Unix as an example, we have process priorities. If we already have process priorities, then all of the kernel level processes are going to run faster than all of the user mode processes because they have a higher priority. They're in a separate queue. So when the kernel level processes are empty, nothing in that queue, then a user mode one's going to run, or it's going to run inter interleaved, you know, at maybe a shorter, a longer frequency perhaps. And then we're going to have this priority, and then we can set up a short term, a medium term, and a long term queue and reroute. So we have short term processes are ones that are going to require a lot of CPU time. You know, they're ready for CPU time. Medium could be like that place between the short and the long. Long term is going to be everybody, and it's going to be some of them that are going to be routed towards other level queues for I.O. So if you set up I.O. queues, and then you break out the process control block, this process is an I.O. bound process. This process is a CPU bound process. Organize the whole scheme much better. 
that's what modern day operating systems are doing. Uh, but we need to compare it in order to actually see why we need it. So, so we'll end uh, today at the concept of what CPU scheduling is all about, and the next time you pick up, go through all of the different algorithms, which is kind of interesting, and I believe I have an assignment that has you compare two CPU schedulers. So, and you know, of course, you know, first come, first in, we always have the last in, first out. <laughs> you know, we have all the different variations of that as well. So, Questions? No? Okie dokie. Hey, next week is uh, Halloween, by the way. And there's going to be a Halloween costume contest, by the way. And if you're lucky, I might actually dress up. <laughs> I won't tell you what I'm going to be, though. I don't know yet, actually. <laughs> if I can find a costume, I might actually be in costume. Because the teachers, they have, and I'm going to be the only teacher who dresses up. We have our own contest, so I'm going to win. <laughs> I'm optimistic. See you next time.